today at the National Press Club, Independent Senator Lydia Thorpe. The Jabarung Gunai Gunachamara politician quit the Greens earlier this year to advocate the black sovereign movement's opposition to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to parliament. Lydia Thorpe, today at the National Press Club. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia in Canberra for the Westpac Address, coming to you from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. My name is Anna Henderson. I'm the SBS Chief Political Correspondent and a director here at the club. Now, before we get started, we just have to give a, a quick cheer to the Matildas playing tonight. Today we are all some version of <laughs> Sam Kerr and the team. Go the Matildas. <laughs> But now let's get on down to business. Our guest today is Lydia Thorpe, crossbench Victorian senator, to make her address to the National Press Club. It's entitled, It's Time for Us to Mature as a Nation. Lydia Thorpe is a Gunai Gunditjmara Jaburung uh, mother, grandmother, activist and politician. She grew up in public housing, faced domestic violence, brought up children as a single mum and propelled herself into policy and advocacy, then into Victorian Parliament before becoming the first Aboriginal Federal Senator for Victoria. Despite being elected as a representative of the Greens, earlier this year she defected to the crossbench, partly over the Greens' decision to back the push for a constitutionally enshrined Indigenous voice to Parliament. Now an independent, describing herself as representing the Black Sovereign Movement, arguing the referendum is not a step in the right direction. Before we get started as well, it's important to note we have invited politicians across the spectrum to address the National Press Club over the referendum, which is just a few months away. That includes the strongest no campaign representatives, the opposition leader, Peter Dutton, and the shadow minister for Indigenous Australians, Jacinta Nampajimpa Price. Senator Price has accepted an invitation to speak and is in the process of finalising a date. And another prominent no campaigner, Warren Mundine, postponed his address but has committed to setting an alternative date. We have also invited the Prime Minister to deliver an address before the vote. Now on to today's address and it's Senator Thorpe's birthday too, so happy birthday. <laughs> Now you can follow the conversation at Press Club Ost or hashtag MPC. Let's welcome the Senator. Thank you very much uh, for allowing me to have a platform to tell some hard truths in this country. Uh, I first would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Ngunnawal Ngambri people, who have maintained this part of the country since millennia, who've nurtured, who have resisted, protested, uh, and acknowledge those struggles for you to be here today and also that of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in Canberra. I pay my respects to the warriors who have always maintained our sovereign stance in this country. I'm Lydia Thorpe, Lydia Alma Thorpe after my grandmother. I'm a Gunai Gunuchamara and Japarung woman. And today I want to take you on a journey a journey that talks about my country and my people. I want to talk about the pain that we are feeling and the fights that we are fighting. I will tell you about the proposed voice to parliament is not a step in the right direction and that we need to mature as a nation instead and what that looks like. I'm a senator representing the Black Sovereign Movement. This is not a new movement. It is just that we have never had a platform nor an audience willing to listen before. We speak truth to power and our resistance started the day war came here, <coughs> uninvited 
to our shores, to the shores of this beautiful country. 90% of our people were killed off for the privilege that you all have today. We speak truth to power and our resistance and the violent massacres known as the frontier wars. Victoria alone, at least 50 frontier war massacres. My mob, Gunditjmara and Japarung, my grandmother's country, had 70 clans living in peace and harmony pre-colonisation. The blood. This is my matriarchal sign of resistance. It's an 1800 cloak. It comes from the 1800s. And I have the markings of my Japarung matriarchs always engraved in my body. 70 Gundachamara clans down to seven to seven, and two of those descendants are in this room today. How is this not war, Australia? How is this not war? On my grandfather's country, Gunai country, you call it Lake Centrance or the Gippsland Lakes or the 90 Mile Beach when you go on your holidays, it was a sport to shoot black. A sport to shoot blacks. My people, Br Brabralung clan of the Gunai. The Black War, or what is sometimes called the Tasmanian War, resulted in at least a thousand Aboriginal deaths, likely many more, and led to a near destruction of First Peoples in Lutruweta, Tasmania, what you call Tasmania. A near complete destruction. How is that a not an attempted genocide? How is it not war? The extreme cruelty of colonisation has devastated, has had devastating effects on our culture, our sacred sites, on our lives, on the lives of our children, it tortures our minds, souls and bodies. And we still carry this trauma that has been passed down through generations in our hearts and our bodies. The frontier wars have never ended. Same war, different weapons. The same domination of First Peoples for access to our land and resources. Our people are still rounded up and locked into cages at the highest rates in the entire world. That's something to be proud of, right? Our children are still, still being snatched away and taken from country. Great. Our people are still being dispossessed of our country, forced into homelessness on our own lands, while sacred sites continue to be blown up for profit. This is the continued cultural genocide of our people. This is our inheritance. This is our inheritance. This is our struggle. Our children were ripped from their mother's arms and put into institutions and homes where they were subject, subjected to physical, sexual and emotional abuse. This continues today. One in six of our children are torn away from their families. And we are seeing ever increasing rates of child removals across this country. 23,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out of home care today. Something to be proud of, right? But despite 250 years of attacks on our people and country, we have survived. We have demonstrated the power of our culture to hold us together and continue to protect and care for country that sustains us all. I invite all Australians to come on a journey 
and look through the lens of First Peoples and how we connect to country. First Peoples of these lands and waters connect to country akin to our mother. We love, nurture and respect country like we do our mother. The water that runs through our country is like the blood that runs through our veins of our mother giving life. If we continue to bring harm to country, we will ultimately bring harm to ourselves. We are the oldest continuing living culture on the planet. Surely that's something to be proud of. We have lived through two ice ages, countless fires, droughts and floods. We know how to care for country, but we are not allowed to do so. Your laws, your metal bars, concrete and police stand in the way, keeping us from our mother. Just last week, I learnt that a sacred Japarong women's birthing tree had been vandalised and poisoned, proven this morning. Yes, it's poison in the three drill holes in that tree. It was a disgusting attack and I still am completely devastated. I brought some of the bark from that tree and the fire remnants of our ceremony. The only way I can try to make the rest of the country understand the depth of pain we feel when sacred sites have been attacked is likening, likening it to the death of our mother. Grief, loss, despair. First Peoples don't have inherent rights, don't just have inherent rights. We have an inherent responsibility to care for country. That's, we all have responsibility, you know? You don't just say you're a black fella. Black fella comes with responsibility to care for country, care for our totems. We have to do that. We have expressed our grief, our pain, our hurt to the world. We have been forced to share details about the intimacy of, of, a, of a birthing site out of desperation to protect our country. <coughs> that is what the paternalistic, paternalistic colonial legal system forces us to do. We must relive our trauma in courtrooms and news headlines while the audience stands by and judges if we are a worthy case. This is not the way it has to be. We set up the Japarung Heritage Protection Embassy and successfully maintained an embassy for two years along the Western Highway. We welcomed everyone who wanted to learn and protect. Right up until the embassy was violently torn apart by hundreds of police officers who had the green light from the government of the day and the hand-picked advisory bodies. How could a road that shaves six minutes, six minutes to people travelling on that highway outweigh protecting a site of such high cultural significance? Over 800 years old we're talking about, these maternity birthing trees. How could... How could the Japarung birthing trees be subjected to the violence of today. But today, again, we heard of another example of country being hurt with a giant old growth tree being cut down. These are ancestor trees. They hold knowledge to keep this earth and this country together. The destruction is the reality lived by First Nations people fighting to protect country across this land and across the world. Indigenous peoples across the world protect 90% of the planet's remaining biodiversity. We are the ones fighting to keep the waterways clean, the air breathable, 
the land healthy, <clears throat> protecting them from the violence of colonial governments that continue to pillage, plunder and pollute. The Australian colony is an imperial occupation of the lands of hundreds of sovereign nations. It is a project that subdues, oppresses and exploits First Peoples and our sovereignty in order to extract wealth just so a handful of people can profit. The colonial project killed and dispossessed First Peoples to get this power and wealth. And it will do whatever it needs to hold on to it. It relies on the oppression and denial of First Nations sovereignty in order for it to exist. When we talk about sovereignty, we are talking about much more than just the romanticised spiritual notion talked about in the Uluru Statement. We are talking about real political sovereign power. And I know that might make people feel com uncomfortable, but too bad. That's why the government is scared to acknowledge it. We are talking about sovereign rights, rights to our homelands, our rights to nurture our lands, water, sea, country, and sky as we have for millennia. Our right to veto anything that has a destructive impact on our mother. To have the final say over the logging and destruction of our forests and bushlands. The right for us to protect country and to prevent extinction. Ecosystem collapse and bushlands. The right for us to protect country and the right to ensure a future for all people of these lands by practicing sustainability, love and respect. Our people have never ceded sovereignty. We have never given up our right to manage our own lands and our own people. That is our constitution. We've got the oldest constitution on the planet. Yours has only been here a couple of hundred years. And it defies the real laws of these lands. This sovereign right has existed forever and it still remains. Our sovereignty is our right to self-governance and to be the architects of our own future. It is the right to make and enforce our own laws, the right to economic independence and the right to self-determine our own destiny. Our sovereignty is real. The only thing we lacked is the power to enforce it without interference by the colonial government. But that is different now. We are strong, we are united, and our power is growing. The fight has always been about our sovereignty, and it continues today. This is why I'm standing here as a member of the Black Sovereign Movement. We are the cultural descendants of this resistance and we continue to retain our unceded sovereignty and continue to fight for our sovereign rights. I'm not standing here as merrily myself, but as one of many, as part of this lineage of fighters. We are the grassroots activists, organisers, campaigners, elders, professors and lawmen and women who have been leading our people's resistance since colonisation began. And we will continue to resist the colony until our sovereign peoples have freedom and until we have regained rights over our own lands. This country, your system of government, has been built on lies, lies. And the referendum for the voice to parliament is a continuation of these lies. It promises to finally fix the Aboriginal problem. It is false hope. 
because it is tricking people into genuinely believing that a powerless advisory body is going to protect our country and sacred sites, save our lives, keep our babies at home. The voice is the window dressing for constitutional recognition. We have rejected constitutional recognition before. It's, it is a 20-year-old Howard era policy created with the explicit purpose of undermining sovereignty, self-determination and land rights for First Peoples. The Black Sovereign Movement has been consistent to the opposition of any form of constitutional recognition and this voice to Parliament. This is just another attempt by a colonial government to make clear that it has power over us and force its rules upon us. I've been hearing all over the place that people should vote yes in the referendum because this is what First Peoples are asking for. But who are the First Nations representatives the government have been talking to? When the government of the day strategically selects which voices they want to listen to, who they want on their advisory bodies, they're already in the process of manufacturing the consent that they need to destroy country and continue their colonial project. And when you give a voice to only a selected few, you also inherently silence others. Silencing every other black fella in this country, silencing the diversity of our people, silencing the knowledge and wisdom of our people. This, pro this proposal is an insult to our intelligence, a breaking of our cultural protocols, and an insult to the tens of thousands of people that marched on Invasion Day this year calling for treaty. Do not expect us to be silently complicit in our own colonisation. The voice is the easy way to fake progress without actually having to change a thing. It is a destructive distraction absolving the government of its continued crimes. If you judge the proposed voice by Article 1, of the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights, all peoples have the right to self-determination. The same right is affirmed in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, what we call the UNDRIP. That would mean deciding our own fate, not advising others to decide, to decide over us in whatever way they wish. The voice cannot give us what we need. It has no power to return land, deliver services, distribute resources, enact laws, or even block racist laws. It cannot build a single house for our people. In fact, there is no guarantee it will do anything at all. The voice is subordinate to the federal government, to the very system oppressing us since colonisation. The voice provo proposal endorses the racist ideology that black people have to be governed by someone else. The voice doesn't end domination, but affirms it. There are three positions on this proposed voice. The yes, the conservative racist no, and the progressive no. The so-called progressive no is the position of the black sovereign movement and others. We get attacked by the Yes campaign for siding with the racists by standing in the way of progress. Yet we are actually doing the opposite. We have done what everyone should do and actually analyse the proposed voice 
for the conservative proposal of a powerless advisory body that it is. We are merrily pointing out that there is no progress, that there is false hope and that we deserve better. This is why we should call off the referendum. It has caused nothing but harm and division. And for what? There won't be change until this society changes, until this society's thinking, values, attitudes and systems have been revolutionised in order to ensure real self-determination. We cannot continue the legacy of the Australian colony. What we need is an end to the war on our people that started on the day the boats arrived. There are five elements to how we get there, just like there are five elements in nature. The five elements of the way forward are truth-telling, implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, as well as implementing the Bringing Them Home report to stop the children from being taken away, implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which we know Labor are stalling and blocking at every uh, chance they can get, and treaty. The first step in acknowledging our rights is being truthful about the history of this country. No more shying away from the brutal past and ongoing colonial violence. Truth is a sign of maturity. And the only way we can overcome this country's hurtful history and create something new. A Truth and Justice Commission could be at the heart of these efforts allowing individuals, organisations and institutions to come forward to tell the, the true story of this place. It's not pretty and it's a hard task and one that's going to take time. But we can't do without it. We need peace. We cannot have peace without truth. Only through uncovering the history of this country through rewriting it in an honest way, can we rewrite its future? The next three steps are about implementing advice that has been out there for decades. Solutions we know are needed and will work. When I first walked into the Senate chamber, I carried a message stick of 441 deaths in custody reco recorded since the reporting of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody alone. Now we're at over 500 deaths in custody. I've only been there two years. Governments could have prevented these deaths by implementing the recommendations of that Royal Commission. Yet 32 years later, when I was 17, pregnant, 32 years ago, we're still waiting for action. My firstborn was 32 years ago. Similarly, similarly, we have now been waiting for 26 years for the recommendations of the Bringing Them Home report to be implemented and to finally stop our children being removed from their families, communities, country, language and culture. Despite both child removals and deaths in custody continuing to rise, successive governments have continued to ignore the recommendations put forward in these reports. Recommendations that were based on expert findings and extensive consultation and contained extensive evidence-based advice. And yet all the Albanese Labor government has done in the past 18 months is implement a recommendation that counts real-time reporting of deaths in custody, which is basically a live court of the black bodies coming out of their prisons in body bags. What an insult to those families. The United Nations Declaration, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples clearly outlines the most basic rights for our people. 
These are not individual rights, but focus on self-determination, cultural rights and the rights of collective, of the collective. The declaration is not putting forward anything extraordinary, but putting existing human rights principles into a First Nations context. What that effectively means is that nothing about us should happen without us and that we have a right to self-determination. We need governments to not just engage in tokenistic consultation and consultation is not consent. We ask for the principles of free, prior and informed consent to be adhered to. That means engaging with our people in a respectful way. Recognise the wealth of knowledge, the care for country, culture and community, and respecting our decisions. Successful implementation of UNDRIP in other countries has proven that decisions made by the people for the people will have better outcomes, not just for our people, but for you all. This will provide a greater chance to survive and thrive as a people all of us. Last year I introduced a private senator's bill to parliament to enshrine the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in Australian law. It is not asking the government to fix everything overnight, but to develop an action plan on how to effectively implement the UNDRIP in this country. This would require an analysis of existing legislation on how it adheres to UNDRIP principles, outlining which legislation needs to be changed to stop the violations of our rights and prioritising change. We acknowledge that this is a process that requires time, but we need to start it now. In a Senate inquiry on the implementation of the UNDRIP in Australia, we heard overwhelming support for enshrining the UNDRIP into domestic law as the number one means to our rights actually being respected. Adhering to the UNDRIP would do vastly more for our people than any voice ever could or would. Last but not least, I want to talk about treaty. Treaty is the end to the war that was declared on us when the ships arrived. Treaty is a peacemaking instrument. Treaty is a way for two sovereign parties to negotiate on a way forward and agree through an internationally recognised formal legal agreement. Treaty provi provides us with the opportunity to negotiate on the things that matter to us. This includes, but is not limited to, land and sea rights. The courts recognise that terra nullius was a myth and that this land is ours. But instead of land rights, we got native title. A token gesture that has caused many disputes in our communities. And that can be extinguished by the government of the day with a flick of a pen. People need to understand that native title is not land rights. Native title is racist. Native title forces us to claim our own land and justify our existence and connection to the coloniser. <laughs> the coloniser then decides if it is legitimate it's an insult beyond words. We need to have a discussion about land back. One simple way to initiate land back is a moratorium on the sale of Crown land across this country. Once privatised, that land is locked away and is not coming back easily. This land doesn't belong to the Crown. Come on. It never has, and it should be handed back to First Peoples, whose land it is. Treaty provides us with an opportunity to put everything on the table, to reset the framework and heal. Peace treaties must be front and centre with every one of our nations to self-determine for themselves. We are not one homogenous group. 
as much as the colonial project would like us to be. We know treaties can be broken, and they have been, but we have an opportunity in this country right now to have treaties of the 21st century. And we can learn all of the lessons from our brothers and sisters around the world. Treaty is what we make it. It has to come from the people. And the best part, you don't need a referendum for a treaty, just a government who is willing. Senate seats can be legislated. Recommendations can be implemented. Change can happen. This is our chance to mature as a nation, to have the hard conversations with each other and ourselves, to confront the racism we have all been socially conditioned to accept, internalise and perpetrate, to sit with the uncomfortable truth, see it and grow from it, because right now, there is an ongoing colonisation, but no colonisers. Racism, but no racists. And when we begin to tell the truth, that we can heal together as a nation, and from this healing, treaty will bring peace. So I invite you all to walk with me, embark on this journey, Stand with our people. Stand up for what really matters. Demand actual change, not tokenistic gestures. And we do have a lot of work to do, and we need to do it together. We need to do it now. If we do this through respect and understanding, we can create peace. This is the start of a revolution of change and justice. Join us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your time and for your speech today, Senator. Uh, in in the referendum approach period, people will decide yes or no. Uh, by, by aligning yourself in the no side of the ledger, you're essentially, at a very basic level, aligning yourself with One Nation, uh, some fringe groups, some of which have actually questioned your own Indigenous heritage, and many of whom never want to see a treaty. So how do you reconcile the fact that you've now become aligned with them, and is there anything that the government could offer that would move you to the yes camp? Uh, well, absolutely. There's always been uh, conversation and negotiations on me supporting this referendum. Uh, I've been working, I started uh, negotiating as a Greens senator uh, and I continued as an independent senator to negotiate how we could uh, have those recommendations implemented as a matter of urgency. I pleaded with the Attorney General and I also mentioned to the PM last week that this would potentially get me over the line. I'm, I'm not asking for all the recommendations all at once. I'm asking for my people, I'm pleading for my people that they implement those recommendations because that will save lives. So you're talking about the Deaths in Custody Royal Commission specifically or...? And the um, Bringing Them Home report. My mother was a part of... Uh, she was a co-commissioner in the Victorian inquiry with Sir, Sir Ronald Wilson, an incredible man. Uh, so... If, if we can't go back to the solutions that our old people uh, and people like allies like Sir Ronald Wilson in those days, then we're tinkering around the edges. I don't think that we, could, we need to wait for a, a powerless voice to say to the government, hey, why don't you uh, implement the recommendations that are going to save lives? We can do it now. 
We can do it now and I'm only interested in justice and saving people's lives and keeping babies with their families. So the government have had an opportunity to do this uh, and they haven't come good. They haven't shown good faith as, as yet. And in terms of the no, the racist no, well, I, they're aligning themselves with us. I don't align myself with racists. Racism is what is the problem in this country. It's like a cancer, it's a sickness, and it makes us sick. Uh, and I think that it's easy to put the black sovereign movement into the camp of the racists because that's convenient. That's convenient to keep your hand on your heart and say yes. I think what I would say to you is have a look at what the black sovereign movement is truly about. Uh, and it's, it's, it's about challenging this country on sovereignty. You know, why can't we have a co conversation about sovereignty? Is, is the king our sovereign? Is the king our sovereign? Does the king care about the Japarung trees? So talk to the real sovereigns and let's negotiate what sovereignty looks like in this country. Thank you. Sarah basford Canales. Thank you, Senator, for your speech. Um, I also just want to say happy birthday. What a way to spend it. Um, I know you um, are calling for the referendum to be cancelled, but the Prime Minister isn't likely to allow that to happen. Um, if there is a no victory, um, by what mechanism um, will justice for First Nations people be achieved when, so, when many progressives will feel demoralised and the no campaigners um, can claim a mandate for um, stopping change? I think the uh, whatever way, yes or no, that we will continue to fight for treaty, we will continue to fight uh, to have our sovereignty acknowledged in this country. I don't think a yes or no result is going to make any difference, regardless of what it is. If it's no, well, we know that the country's racist, like it is. It is a racist country. 20 years ago in the reconciliation movement, in fact, 22 years ago, I was there. Again, I was pregnant with another kid walking across the bridge in Sydney. The ultimate outcome of the reconciliation movement back then was that the country was too racist to reconcile. So we have an opportunity to, do, to continue some of that good work that that council did and continue a push for treaty and truth. Just quickly, um, you did say if the no vote is successful that it shows that Australia is a racist country. How do you sort of reconcile that given you're also advocating for a no vote? Well, I think um, even with a yes vote uh, outcome, then it's still a um, denial of what the black sovereign movement is about and it's hand on heart do-gooders who think they know what's best for us. So that's a form of racism as well. Thank you. Andrew Tillett. Uh, Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review. Thank you, Senator. Um, the, the history of civil rights movements around the world has always been one of incremental progress. Um, I, I, under, I understand and appreciate your criticism of the voice uh, as being false, pro fake progress, I think was your, your description of it. But it, surely is something better than nothing to then use as a platform to go on? Because it seems if, 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 the, if the no vote prevails when we wake up on the Sunday morning after the referendum, what next? Mm. I mean, will, it, will that result be, you, you talked about it sort of indicating, you know, a sign of a racist country, that would suggest that, that any hope of progress on the issues that you, you raise, including treaty which uh, politicians have run a mile from uh, in this, this campaign, will have uh, a less chance of getting up than, than perhaps it would have had the day before? We have to um, remember that we're talking about almost 250 years of invasion, disease, murder, theft, destruction, poisoning waterholes, poisoning trees, 250 years almost. 2023 and all they have to offer is a powerless little advisory body with parliamentary supremacy over it at all times. The Minister herself for Indigenous Affairs is saying, oh, they, they can now, yeah, we'll get them talking about housing and 
child removal and we'll get them talking about health. Well, hang on. Where's the voice in this? How can she dictate what the voice decides to talk about? And I don't trust this government in who their captain's picks are and neither do many people across this country. There are people that, those people are already doing all right and those people are forgetting about their poor cousins on country. So I think that, um, you know, this, this notion of, oh, but it's a start. That's another insult to our intelligence. That's an insult to our ancestors and all of our people who've passed in every prison, in every institution. It's an insult because it's not good enough after 200 years that we just get offered a powerless advisory. It's not good enough. It's disgusting. We want a treaty, and yes, treaty will take some time, but it shouldn't be up to politi politicians. My speech talked about the people. The people decide who the politicians are. If the people want a treaty, then they need to make that happen themselves and get rid of those that don't want that because that's the device the division that is happening in this country. We want peace, we want to bring the nation together. You want to celebrate 26th of January? Well, I don't. The re most of the country do, every year. Sick of it. We don't, we don't want to protest no more. Understand, you were dancing on our graves on the 26th of January. It's invasion day. Let's come up with a day that we can all celebrate. Let's have a treaty day. Like, the, it's, it's a blank canvas in this country to have a treaty. We just need the government will and the people power to make it happen. Thank you, and happy birthday. And I, I think it's worth pointing out that what the government has proposed is not a hand-picked group. They're talking about this group being either elected or put forward by local communities. Hmm. So do you acknowledge that that's not what they're proposing? Well, Labor are good at picking people out of local communities as well. That's how the dialogues happen. They were all uh, CEOs and uh, chairpersons of the local organisations and the corporations that the government always deal with. So I can see, you know, I can see how this is going to pan out and it's not going to have grassroots voices, it's not going to have activists, they've already said that. And the only democracy, the democracy that we have in our um, society as First People is it's, it's done by clan and nation. We're not one mixed community of a whole, you know, Japarung and... Gun eye, we don't all sit in the same. Your family don't do that with your next door neighbours. You don't want your, your neighbourhood watch to decide what happens in your neighbourhood. Or do you? Well, you want your family to decide, your family clan. That's all we want. We have to provide inform free. <laughs> free means it's free. We can't be begging for the information. And we need time to understand what is going on. And once we have that time, then we can talk about consent. But it's got to happen at the clan and nation level. You all acknowledge country on whatever country you're on. Well, they're the only people that can speak for their country. You can't bring Noel Pearson into Gunai country and, tell, and him tell us what's best, which is what seems to be going on here. It's got to be given back to the people, for our people to self-determine their own destiny. Paul Sakal. Thanks, Senator. It's Paul Sakal from the Nine Papers. I just wanted to ask a question about the span of your career. It's a bit of a longer question. I apologise. In we'll Victoria... Keep it fairly brief. Pardon? We'll keep it fairly brief. I'll be as quick as I can. Well, in 50 today, so it's a long time. <laughs> Happy birthday. Um, in the Victorian Parliament in 2017 and 18, you were one of the chief critics of the treaty, which was the first treaty of its kind in Australia. Apart from right-wing liberals, you were really the chief critic of it. You're, the essence of your argument now is that we need a treaty, not voice. 
in May of this year, just a couple of months ago, you said you wouldn't be leading a progressive no campaign. You were still deciding which way you were going to vote. A month later in the Senate, you were proudly progressive no, and now you're in the really the most important platform in the country saying, I'm a progressive no. Um, in a profile piece in The Age a couple of years ago, you were described as an ineffective representative, more focused on adversarial outcomes than actual Indigenous advancement. I'm wondering at what point in the Victorian Parliament or this Parliament have you worked across the aisle or with other parties to mm. achieve policy outcomes for Indigenous Australians? Mm. Thank you. That's a, a good question to actually find out what I actually do in my day-to-day -day life instead of looking at the media. <laughs> Uh, so the treaty in Victoria started with government control. The Aboriginal Affairs Victoria director was the chairperson of the first treaty working group, which I was a part of. So right from the outset, we were dictated to by the Labor government in Victoria through their most senior director for Aboriginal Affairs. He also come from the AFL. There's a bit of a churn of people. They, you know, they're all feather in each other's nests. Uh, so we have 38 nations in Victoria, and 12 of those nations were select, selected to participate in the treaty. How can those 12? One got um, uh, expelled because they took a million bucks for the Japarung trees that were cut down. They'd done a dodgy deal with Labor and we called them out and they got disqualified off the treaty assembly. So we're now down to 11 nations out of 38. You cannot have 11 nations speak for 38 nations. I've always been critical of that and I've always said that we need a 30, uh, we, I ran a 38 nation rally. Hello, there's more people than just those 11 that have been picked by government. I, we need a treaty in this country because we need peace, but it's got to be done genuinely and respectfully and not the hand-picked captains. Those same captains are on the yes camp, yes camp too. Jess Malcolm. Jess Malcolm from the Australian newspaper. Thanks for your speech, Senator. I just wanted to ask how you expect a treaty could address financial compensation or reparations for Indigenous people and what should that look like? Well, that's up to each clan and nation to decide for themselves. And that's where someone like me, someone like Noel Pearson or, or the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, they can't decide what that is for each clan and nation in this country. There has to be individual negotiations and we can do this, it's possible. I've worked for local government. I worked for the peak body in local government for three years. I worked with 79 councils in Victoria. We've got 79 councils there and 38 nations. It's possible. You look at the, the local government structure, we can fit in that through a treaty. We just need to tweak it. So, um, it's up to those clans and nations, but there is a lot of money owed to First Peoples. I mean, look at the resources that have been extracted over 200 years. You know, we don't want to send the country broke. I'll put that out there now. Otherwise, we could with what is owed. You look at the Victorian Parliament, it's made up of sandstone from from uh, Garraword. Garraword is what you've pro probably all been to. Hall's Gap, the Grampians. That is so stolen sta sandstone that built Victorian Parliament. You know, I could send Dan Andrews a bill as a traditional owner, but I'll save him from that. Could, could you estimate, would you, would you say it's in the billions? It would make the country broke. That's why we need to negotiate. Thank you. Maeve Bannister. 
Thanks, Senator, for your speech. Maeve Bannister from the Australian Associated Press. Um, last month you flagged you are considering not running for re-election when your term um, is finished, saying that you'd like to make way for new people and fresh ideas. It's obviously still a few years away, but um, have you made a final decision and would you consider starting your own political party or backing uh, particular candidates? Um, thank you. Well, I'm 50 today. I was born on the 16th of August in 1973 and I'm tired already. I've seen my, my grandmothers, my mother struggle through this, through native title, through deaths in custody, through destruction of land and I'm tired and Aboriginal women don't live as long as white women in this country. Our life expectancy is not as long as yours. We don't have the privilege. So in five years, I'll be 55. And I, I do want some peace in my life from this hard fight and this hard struggle. And I do think that there are too many old crusty politicians in there that have no idea what it's like to struggle. I feel like they need to retire and let the younger generation through because it's, the, it's our young people's future. And we've got people stuck in the Stone Age in that place. It just won't let go of the power and the privilege. It's, it's embarrassing. People, old fellas falling asleep in the chamber and like that's, that's the real colonial stuff we've got to rid. Let the younger breed come in, whoever they are, particularly women, once we make it safer. But that's what I'm going to be moving over for because that's the right thing to do as a leader. Thank you. Ben Westcott. Ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Thank you for your speech, Senator. I hope you do something better for your birthday tonight. <laughs> um, you've spoken a lot about how uh, you're critical of the proposal for The Voice because it's symbolic, it's, um, it won't make actual change. On the other hand, you're, you're very uh, uh, you're pushing very hard for the idea of a treaty. Um, isn't there a, a risk, though, that a treaty would be equally, if not possibly even more symbolic uh, and ineffectual than the voice, particularly given in Victoria, where you're from, one of the places most advanced in um, their treaty negotiations, that's exactly where these birthing trees have been under threat for, for so long? Well, it goes to show how well the treaty's going on in Victoria when they're still logging country. Uh, they're still logging the Central Highlands. Uh, we've got seismic testing going on on Gunnachamara country and we have the poisoning of uh, our maternity trees. So the treaty's, you know, leading the way in Vic. Uh, that is not the example to go by in this country. It is not. It's not the most progressive. There are many problems with that treaty. We need national leadership real leadership and we need to uh, create those opportunities for a framework so that they are done right. You can't hand pick those around the table. We've got to have everyone ar around the table if we're going to solve anything. You know, I can't say what mob need and Jar Jar were on country. They know what they need. You go to the elders and the people of that country, they say what we need. But that's different what we need in Gunai country or Japarang country, or Ngunnawal country. It's all different. You can't just put a blanket on us all and say, look, just be happy with that. Be happy with a voice. Treaty has been called for for so long. I'm sure you heard of Yothu Yindi and Treaty. I'm sure you heard of Bob Hawke and Treaty and the Redfern Statement and Treaty. Like, how many times do we need to put it back on the agenda? And there's nothing to be afraid of. It's a blank canvas. It will take time to negotiate. But we don't want to be at war anymore. And we don't want to be the sickest, poorest people in our own country. We want to share some of what you have in your privilege from your, uh, the, her, what you inherit, you know? Think about your inheritance. Where'd it come from? Our blood. Our blood and our misery. Thanks very much. Sarah Tomevska. 
Thank you, Senator Sarah Tomevska from SBS. I was just recently in New Zealand and had the pleasure of interviewing the co-leader of the Maori Party, Debbie Narua Packer. I don't know if you know her, but one of the things she stressed upon me was that even though New Zealand has the Treaty of Waitangi and they have legislated designated seats in Parliament, the impacts of colonisation persist, mm. which is obviously not surprising. But mm. the thing she stressed is that the mechanism is not as important as the ongoing commitment, the relationship that Crown has with First Peoples that we all have as a country. Why are you so sure that the voice can't be the foundation for an ongoing relationship that would deliver the outcomes you want and that have been promised mm. voice, treaty and truth? Well, firstly, they don't speak for me as a sovereign Gunai Gunichamara and Japarung woman. Uh, and, and secondly, John Howard said, you can't treaty with yourself. So why would we go into the colonial constitution when we have our oldest, our own, which is the oldest constitution on the planet, we're being now invited in to the colonial project with a powerless voice. Treaty needs to happen first and we need to negotiate what constitutional recognition looks like for us. It doesn't look like what's on the table now. And I think that's a very um, important point to remember. Howard wanted us in the constitution. He wanted constitutional recognition so that we couldn't treaty with ourselves. Do you want to see a federal treaty as well as state-based ones, just to clarify? I want to see uh, federal leadership on the conversation. I think that the king has to be at the table. Thanks. Dana Morse. Thank you, Senator. Dana Morse from ABC News. You're saying uh, that the door is still open for the government to win you over on the voice proposal. What has the tenor of negotiations been like and uh, why can't they come... Why have they said they can't meet you in what you're calling for in meeting those recommendations? Uh, they've actually had no reason why they can't uh, implement those recommendations. They basically stonewalled me for quite a while when I left the Greens uh, and now they're getting desperate and... and inviting me back in. Uh, so, yeah, there's not been a real response to uh, implementing those recommendations. They continue to do their speeches on closing the gap day and talk about children being removed as one of their priorities, yet they've got this 22-year-old um, report there that has all the answers. So. My, I don't know. I'd like them to answer that. They gave us one recommendation, as I said, and that was counting body bags coming out of the prison. I've had young men tell me where the hanging points are in the prisons. Hanging points are one of the recommendations in the uh, Royal Commission. Just, to, just remove the hanging points so our people and your people can't hang themselves. Just do that. Can we just have one that saves lives? If they committed to the hanging points to imp uh, pushing federal pressure onto the state and territory governments to address that issue of hanging points? No, it'd be more than that. More than it has that. to be more than that because we still have 23,000 Aboriginal children and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care. Two of those kids are... I have two grandkids that are from out-of-home care and I know what it's like. I know that my son and his wife get no support, and that those mo the mother of those children, she's just thrown to the side and told, get yourself together, and if you don't within two years, you've lo lost your kids forever. And that mother has no support, no housing, no, no women's healing, nothing, just thrown to the side. So we have a big issue, and I'm not saying that the, the system is broken, I'm saying that the system was deliberately set up to hurt us. It was deliberately meant to be broken. 
and no, that won't be enough. We have to negotiate a few life-saving uh, other recommendations. I owe that to my old people. I owe that to the many that were involved in uh, that report, and or both reports, in fact. And you just mentioned that earlier that you spoke to the, the Prime Minister as recently as last week. So what was the tenor of that conversation? Uh, well, I think he was a bit surprised to hear about my negotiations um, and my asks. So hopefully he gets up to speed and comes back with um, some form of way forward that we can all agree upon. Rachel Baxter. Rachel Baxter from The Seven Network, thank you for your speech and happy birthday. Just changing the topic here a little bit, on Senator David Van, what is your opinion or do you think that a senator who has been elected on a party ticket to parliament should be allowed to remain on as an independent if they quit or are effectively kicked out? Well, that's also about me, let's be honest. Uh, <coughs> I think that if your workplace is not tenable, then you're allowed to leave your workplace and, and represent in another form. And that's what happened with me personally. I couldn't deal with the internal racism of the Greens. Uh, and in terms of that other senator, um, that's up to the, their party. Um, you know, completely different reasons. Uh, I think that uh, if anyone is doing harm to anyone else in their workplace, then, then yeah, they shouldn't have an opportunity to represent anybody. Thank you. Melissa Code. Hi, Senator. Melissa Code from the Mandarin. You shared with us your five elements as a sort of alternative way forward. And irrespective of the outcome of the referendum later this year, how government approaches First Nations policy is a focus. Um, and certainly the Yes Camp have described the voice as being a way to um, overcome bureaucratic challenges for f poor First Nations outcomes. And I just wanted to ask a question. When you use language like um, the colonial project or um, consultation is not consent, how, does, how do those ideological views, which I'm assuming align with the black sovereign movement, sit with democracy, which sometimes doesn't always satisfy everybody's needs? Can you help explain your five elements and, and that concept of consensus? Hmm. So consensus comes from us. The whole concept of consensus decision making comes from Aboriginal people. We discuss through free, prior and informed consent what the fors and, and against are for a particular issue. And we talk and we talk and we talk and we have our um, matriarchs and, and and the people who make up our society. So they might be language people, law people, uh, all the experts in our society that have maintained and sustained these lands for thousands and thousands of generations. So consensus decision making is something that we do automatically. Uh, and if it, it is up to, we have to decolonise our thinking. It is possible. And I know that you know, talking to mainstream white Australians out there, they want the same. When you get down to the nitty gritty of what we want as a people through respectful conversation, it's the same. So the voice, uh, we're not going to get consensus, consensus with the voice ever because some families are bigger than others. Some people have more votes than others through the white fellas democracy. We have to go back to the way we make decisions as clans and nations, and then we can tell the colonisers what the terms are, not the other way around. We have to reset the relationship in this country and not seeing us, stop seeing us as an issue. You know, the indigenous issues, the Aboriginal problem, 
oh, you know, the drunken black or whatever your stereotype is, it's got to stop because we hold the knowledge of these lands and waters. We hold the solution to climate change. We can't even get in with half the greenies because they think they know best. So there's, there's this outright racism, like the racist no, and there's this underlying racism with the yes. Because it's what people, people are thinking, this is gonna be great. You know how many white fellas have told me this is gonna be so great for me? It's so patronising. And so we have a real opportunity and handpicking people does not work. And the system has to change for us, not us change for the system. And, and just to help us understand your position a bit better, when you talk about decolonising thinking and you certainly convey messages which um, call for more than reform, but you know, rebuilding total structures, while the system is um, broken and hasn't delivered good outcomes, it's also given someone like you who disagrees with the system legitimacy and, and a platform and maybe not, you know, total power to sign on the dotted lines as you describe. Um, some solutions can be easily solved, but, but you are given um, respect and reverence. So how, how in this system, which is so problematic and needs to be rebuilt, do you reconcile with also being given a voice? I am the body. I am guided by my ancestors and my old people and every black activist out there. That's who I'm guided by. I am just the body that's doing what it's being told. Do you think I wanted to join the colonial project? No, never wanted to. Never voted until Nan ran for ATSIC. But to have this platform, yes, it's a real honour honor and privilege, but it's also a disgusting privilege that I find really difficult. Um, so I'm here to infiltrate the colony. I'm here to rattle the cages of the, the people who've benefited from the rape and pillage of my people and my land. I'm here to make them uncomfortable and that's why I'm there. I'll use that platform, I'll use that privilege to have my people respected for the sovereign people that we are. Thanks. And our final question today comes from Justine Landis-Hanley. Thank you so much, Senator. Justine Landis-Hanley from the Canberra Times. You left the Greens at the start of this year, citing your position on The Voice, and you've spoken out about your experience in the party. I'm wondering, what is your relationship like with the Greens at the moment as someone who's sitting on the crossbench and negotiating with the rest of the crossbench? Mm. And what do you think about the direction that the party has taken? Hmm. Um, there's a lot of really good people in the Greens that I respect and admire and always will respect and admire and still get lovely messages from members. Um, obviously, their decision to support The Voice on a day that I was violently ill was a bit of a kick in the guts. Um, and yes, there are tensions between certain senators uh, and that has made things difficult. But I'm, I'm conciliatory. I think that's the beauty of, of our people is we're the most conciliatory people after so much devastation, we're still coming to you to say, you know, come on, let's go for a treaty now. Let's acknowledge country, like. The Greens have some work to do. They need to decolonise themselves. I, I did my best whilst I was there. Um, they've got to sort out their own issues. They are a very white party. Um, they don't respect the black Greens within. And but as I said, there are good people in the Greens and I hope to continue to work with those that I can work with to get the job done. Um, and just a very quick follow-up to Maeve's question from earlier. Um, would you consider running candidates at the next federal election, perhaps from the Black Sovereign Movement? Well, I've asked, yes, and sorry for not answering that earlier. Um, I've asked the Black Sovereign Movement what they want to do. And they're very excited by the notion. So 
I just don't want to be the one having to organise them and, you know, doing all the campaigning. So if I can, if that's what they want to do, then absolutely I think that we should have a black sovereign movement um, in, a, in a party where we have candidates to really ramp it up and bring truth and healing to this country once and for all. Okay, well, thank you for your time today. Please join me in thanking Lydia Thorpe.